Welcome back. Let's get right into it. Our last video left off of the appearance of jellies. Now at the same time, worms were evolving, and around 600 million years ago, these worm species broke off into two new types of organisms, the protostomes and the deuterostomes. Protostomes soon branched off into arthropods, and arthropods are the invertebrates with jointed legs, like insects, shrimp, spiders, and crabs. Deuterostomes are the ancestors to all vertebrates, and were introduced to Earth in the form of starfish and sea urchins. These vertebrate ancestors paved the way for cartilage and bone to take shape as an internal component, not just as an exterior protection like the protostomes. Now, by moss slowly evolving roots, they slowly inch their way inward, away from the water source in search of better light, closer to the sun. In the sea and near the shore, worms are digging into the ground as well, consuming oxygen out of the water. Water, and this results in a global decline in oxygen for a while. The organisms seem to have rebounded with a few extinctions in some species, most likely the ones that consume the most oxygen, presumably. Meanwhile, above the sea, on land, the continents are in a new formation called Pinocia. Keep in mind, the continents never stay in one place. They are always moving, even right now. But like I said, it's only like a meter or so every one million years. So this brings us to a new eon, the Phanerozoic Eon, a new era, the Paleozoic era, and a new period called Cambrian. Now, everything up till Cambrian is referred to as pre-Cambrian, considering that not much happens, and Cambrian is when life really explodes. Now, the first oxygen-dependent animals, called Ediacaran fauna, have appeared, and these are mainly fish. Now, vertebrates are animals that have a backbone that connects the brain, skeleton, and nervous system all together as one working machine. And by the way, they are the first animal with a brain. A very, very small brain, but a brain nonetheless. These vertebrates need the oxygen that's in the water. The first fish species were probably something like a hagfish, which started out small, then grew in size as it progressed with evolution, and as its food supply grew around it as well. Fish have evolved into an animal that could place its information into a pod called an egg. The first few most likely laid pre-fertilized eggs themselves, then presumably developed the need for fertilization from a partner as an added precaution to get another survivor's information added in. As this process evolved, the system got more precise, and the partners got more choosy. And this creates a competition between the genders. And with competition comes drive. With drive, there comes evolutionary changes within that species, between the genders, with males becoming more aggressive and females becoming more selective. This is also when plants develop the use of seeds. Seeds are the plant's version of an egg. And they use spores, a primitive version of pollen, to fertilize their seeds. And then we reach the Ordovician period. This is when the supercontinent is formed as Gondwana. All the land mass has collected in the southern hemisphere of the planet. And with the exploration of moss going more and more inland, new plants emerge that have a better root system. And these plants were hornwort and liverwort, and these began emerging from their home on the sea coast. Then, as they went inward as well, ferns started emerging, with stronger roots and longer leaves to catch the sunlight. At the end of the Cambrian and the beginning of Ordovician, we have a global extinction event, as you can see by this line. I changed the opacity to 85% to show the amount of species that actually died off in this event. There are many species that die off completely. I just can't fit everything in, obviously, so just keep in mind that 15 out of every 100 survive during the period. So it takes a while for the surviving species to rebound. This was caused by the spreading of moss and shallow-rooted plants across the land. They began to eat away at the bedrock with acids, on top of also changing the atmosphere drastically with the changing levels of CO2 and oxygen, which resulted in a massive cool-down of the entire planet. And this actually caused a giant rising glacier in the center of Africa. This caused the shallow water organisms like coral, tube worms, snails, and other smaller vulnerable aquatic life forms to die off. About 60 to 80 percent of marine life was to die from this rapid change in climate and seawater temperatures. The plants themselves came out relatively unscathed as they mainly lived in the more northern tropics at the very tip of Gondwana. 
but the rest of the landmass was entirely on the south pole of the planet. Now, the three northern plates of Gondwana started moving upwards, and they actually collided into each other, fusing pieces together like a seam as they crashed into each other. And this created the mountains of the Appalachians, the Scotland Mountains, and in Ireland and more. Then the Silurian period comes some 443 million years ago. And it's at this time when insects develop on land in the form of centipedes and other creepy crawlies. Then spiders appear, and spiders are the very first land predator ever to exist. And as insects have been developing, they start undergoing metamorphosis. Metamorphosis is when they begin as a crawly, like a caterpillar, and then they emerge as something else. I assume the first types of insects to gain the use of flight would most likely be a type of cicada or a mayfly, a type of insect that lives underground for most of its life and then rises once a year or every few years. Cicadas even now go underground for unbelievable amounts until they rise, depending on the type of cicada they are. I have to believe that they would be the ones able to survive the upcoming extinctions and pass on the use of wings. Most insects we have today evolved in the Triassic and Jurassic periods, meaning they had a pretty good start, which makes me believe that it's a cicada-type animal. Now, as fish evolved, so did their skeletons, and this leads to their fins evolving. The bony skeleton animals branched off into ray-finned and lobe-finned. These lobe-finned evolved into leg-like fins, which lead them to crawling closer and closer to the shore until they actually reached land. Now, the ozone layer had developed with the oxygen to be even stronger and could reflect enough of the ultraviolet radiation at this point to be able to protect these new tetrapods, which are fish with legs. And with tetrapods, they evolve into amphibians. These animals are mainly aquatic as they rely on water to live and they need the water for protection for their eggs from getting dry. These animals developed tiny lung sacs near their gills to allow them to actually transition to land and water. So they have gills and lungs. Okay, so now we're in the Devonian period. While the land is dominated by fish and some amphibians, our plants have evolved larger and larger in competition for sunlight and space. So with this competition, trees start growing because the taller you can get, the more sunlight you can get. The first tree was probably a version of a conifer or a bristled cone tree and had to be a tree that uses spores dispersed by wind as a means to fertilize and reproduce. And by having roots and spreading quickly, forests emerged of primitive trees. Now with these forests growing rapidly, by inhaling carbon dioxide from the air and exhaling it as oxygen, they altered the atmosphere and climate even more dramatically than any organism yet. And as the thousands of years went by, their roots and the littering of their leaves and twigs, not to mention with the burning of some through lightning strikes, this changed the soil nutrient levels and began altering the seawater. And it also helped to filter out the rainfall and the glacier melt through leaves and soil. It essentially created a global cleansing system, which helped create the first freshwater lakes the finish line for a lot of streams. And it ended up being new areas for new life to emerge, creating an entire new evolution of aquatic life. But as these changes in the water happened, some species couldn't keep up and they slowly died off. These mini extinctions came in waves or pulses where a lot of species would die around the same time, causing a chain reaction each time. Now sharks are swimming in the ocean, the colacanth is swimming around, which is still around today, which is awesome. Crabs are all leggy and exoskeleton-y, and then tetrapods start laying hard-shelled eggs, called amniotic eggs. These eggs are awesome because inside all the DNA and the little baby is in there and they are protected from the elements and they won't dry out now. This allows them to migrate away and search for new land as they no longer have to rely on water to protect their eggs. So now we get into the Carboniferous period, and this is named for literally because of all the trees and the changes in the atmosphere that these new forests are creating. This causes another ice age called the Karoo Ice Age. And at this time, the landmass was assembled as Pangaea. With this evolution of eggs and with the spreading of vegetation, animals could now thrive on land. This leads to two types of land tetrapods, sauropsids and synapsid. Now the sauropsids, are primitive reptiles of some sort, and then synapsids are primitive mammal reptiles. These mammal reptiles evolved into pelicosaurs, 
which is a warm-blooded reptilian animal with a lizard-like sail on its back. And this sail was most likely an evolutionary solution to heat control, as land temperatures obviously changed drastically compared to ocean temperatures, so these pelicosaurs evolved a way to actually control their heat. Sauropsids evolved into theropods, which are a more upgraded reptilian animal. And in the meantime, in Laurasia area, the baby Rocky Mountains are born around this time. This is caused by the northwestern migration of the continent, and as it moved, it was pushing north against a Pacific tectonic plate. And this caused a slight wrinkling of the landmass, which started rising in that area. At this time, water is pooling on the sides of the Rocky Mountains, creating what is called the Western Interior Seaway, a shallow sea that covered the interior of the lower portions of most of North America. And it lasted well through the Cretaceous period and into the Paleogene before it started receding. It was filled with giant clams, marine dinosaurs, sharks, Cretaceous giant birds, plankton, and many other weird animals. It also caused a massive deposit of chalk in the middle of the United States, like Kansas in that area, as it actually dried up and receded. And this was caused by eukaryotic phyloplankton that secrete lime as a waste product. Now the Carboniferous period ends with 35% oxygen in the atmosphere. That is close to twice the amount we have today. This increase led to insects becoming incredibly large, with dragonflies' ancestors, for example, being as large as the average bird. But everything was getting pretty huge, and it is assumed it's because of the oxygen level. Now, the Carboniferous rainforest collapse occurs, and this is caused by the shifting of tectonic plates, and those plates actually sucked in large amounts of land into the mantle. Now this is when I assume the mega eruptions in China and the Siberian traps occur following these major shifts. This deposit of trees under the mantle is where we get our coal from today, as they never actually decayed naturally and they fossilized underneath the pressure of the mantle. So this causes the carbon that the dead trees would have been producing as they decayed to never reach the atmosphere. This, over millions of years, meant the carbon couldn't reach the oxygen to combine to create carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas. Greenhouse gases act like a shield retaining the planet's heat. With this thinning of our atmosphere without it, our planet slowly lost heat and it cooled. So it's not so much that oxygen cooled our planet, it's that the oxygen couldn't combine with other elements to create the much needed greenhouse gases. So basically a rise in oxygen means a decrease in other crucial gases. Now during the Permian period, Australian mountains start to form, and a volcano erupts in China and then another in Siberia. Many species that have been thriving for millions of years, like the trilobites for example, are now extinct. This takes us to the Triassic period, 252 million years ago, and this emergence of large animals begins a new era, the Mesozoic era. Now, life is sparse again, yes, but not everything died, and those who survived, along with the eggs that survived in this event and the mammals who tunneled into safety on land, allowed life to continue. So now there's all this extra space, and with all these perfect conditions for life, and not a lot of organisms breathing it in, and no one to eat the plants. So there's oxygen, like, everywhere, and it's slowly increasing. Now, the first newbies of this era aren't quite dinosaurs yet, but they are large. A lot of the species that made it through the extinction evolved to grow larger and larger. Now, as we go into the Jurassic period, we get animals like the Archosaur first, then pterosaurs and prosauropods. These are primitive dinosaurs that are more reptilian than dinosaur. As they evolve, they turn into sauropods, then the Stegosaurus and the Brachiosaurus and others follow. We also have plants evolving to attract new insects through the displaying of flowers for the very first time. And this process gives them more control on fertilizing without relying solely on just wind. And with the extinction of the pelicosaurs, it made room for some more mammalian animals to evolve, like the theriodonts. These are primitive mammals that evolved into something similar to like a tree shrew or a mole or a sort of small raccoon animal. Then a new mega eruption called the Central Atlantic Volcanic Formation erupts, which occurs where all three of the continents of North America, Africa, and Europe meet. This creates a rift and pushes them apart. So this is when Pangaea is really breaking up now as we near the Cretaceous period. Pangaea splits in half from the eruption, creating two continents called Laurasia and Gondwana. Laurasia was mainly North America and Europe, and Gondwana was the rest. 
The few mammals that had evolved so far, they had also dispersed throughout the supercontinent. And as Pangaea broke up, it actually split up these ancestors. So this causes the separated ancestors to evolve in different paths, creating unique forms of mammals. So for example, there's four different main splits of mammals. There's the hooved, which are whales, bats, and dogs, and they're basically the mammals that don't eat with hands. Then there's primates and rodents, which are mammals that do eat with their hands. And then there's anteaters and armadillos, which are things that eat with their nose. And then there's elephants and aardvarks, which are things that have big nose hands. I know that's a little confusing, but those are the four different categories of how life has evolved. Now, our mammal ancestors are starting to be quite recognizable now with fur and teeth, and they're digging tunnels into the ground to escape predators and the elements around them. And these exact traits are what help them to survive the next extinction. And right before this extinction, the theriodons break off into eutheria. Now, eutherians are truly our ancestors. They are mainly mammalian with jaws and evolved teeth with fur as a defense for the weather. Eutheria is a category they call mammals who lay amniotic eggs and nourish their young through placenta within their eggs, as these primitive placentals did not have the pubic bones to allow for expansion of a growing fetus inside them. So this is where the earliest marsupials come into the picture. Marsupials, like today's kangaroos, only have enough space to develop their young inside for a short amount of time, but then very early, these animals are born and then they continue their development inside a pouch that is attached to the outside of the mother's body, compared to inside like all placentals do now. Now platypus type animals have emerged by now, having a successful mix of mammalian and reptilian traits, and these primitive monotremes began successfully thriving as well. Now we have crocodiles, sharks, primitive whales, and other cool new life forms emerging literally all over the place. Now, the primitive trees spread everywhere and deciduous forests of cycads, which is a primitive pine tree, spreads throughout the land at a rapid pace. These original forests of cycads spread to Australia when it was still attached to the mainland. And as Australia drifted away soon after this, it actually took these trees with it. And these trees can still be found in Australia today. Now, this is also when the Daintree Forest starts to develop in Australia as well. Other trees have also evolved fruit in the form of figs and other primitive berry type fruits. These fruits are an upgraded version of the flower, attracting mammals and reptiles instead of insects. These seeds have grown inside of a capsule. This capsule is made to be eaten by the surrounding mammals. When the capsule seeds have finished developing inside its fruity pod, the pod changes color, announcing its viability and it's ready to be eaten and spread around. The seeds have evolved by now to withstand the intestines of these animals and to be small enough to pass through without being chewed up by teeth. Now, this waste that also came with the fruit is technically fertilizer for the next generation of these seeds. If trees were to just create these capsules but couldn't attract mammals through the taste and color, these fruits would just fall off the tree and never escape the shade of the mother tree. These seeds need sunlight, water, and soil nutrients, and by tricking a mammal into transporting them for them, this mixed species teamwork works wonderfully. Other trees have now produced pollen by this time, which is an upgraded version of spores, and it utilizes insects and wind to their full ability. Now, the last period of the Mesozoic era is the Cretaceous period. By 168 million years ago, we have half-feathered reptiles in China. 20 million years later after that, we see our first fossils of a bird, which is found in Europe. Now, by 131 million years ago, we have advanced birds in China now, and we have metatheria and eutheria roaming the continents. We have reptiles growing ever bigger on the other side of the animal tree. We have velociraptors roaming around. We have plesiosaurs swimming in the waters. Birds have taken flight into the air at this point, helping to disperse berries and fruit seeds across vast distances, something plants could never do before in such a reliable way. Birds change trees dramatically. 
And by the 100 million year mark, dinosaurs are at their peak size now. We also have giant sauropids, which are giant squids, sharing the waters. Hardwood trees begin evolving at this point, growing outward with girth, turning carbon from the passing air, layering the carbon as it grows. The two continents of Laurasia and Gondwana start breaking apart even more at this point, and this new section is Amazonia, a larger chunk of what is now South America, which has some extra bits of other continents still attached which will slowly break off in the future. Laurentia loses some of its mass as well, becoming a new continent called Laurentia. At the 93 million mark, oceans are starved of oxygen, and this is due to some catastrophic event, and nearly 30% of the marine life dies off. Now, the plesiosaurs somehow pull through, but many smaller organisms that are more fragile and vulnerable and reliant of specific conditions do not survive. This is when Antarctica breaks off on its own as well. The first true placentals emerge. These animals now have the skeletal ability to hold their offspring in their bodies, feeding them through their own blood supply with an umbilical cord until they are viable to actually breathe, eat, and live on land without the protection of a pouch or an eggshell. They are born live and breathing, fully developed. Around the 70 million mark is when grasses start sprouting up where there were otherwise barren areas. Grass grows upward from the base and it gets all of the nutrients from the water from the ground and grow upward strictly for sunlight needs. This is why we can mow our grass, why animals can graze them and they don't die by being cut, which is huge for the animal kingdom. Their food supply doesn't run out as quickly and grass is very hardy and it starts growing where other plants are not capable of thriving. Now halfway through this period, placentals break off into epitheria. These are more evolved placentals, which result in carnivores omnivores and herbivores. One of the first carnivores to emerge were the canids. These are the primitive wolves, cats, and right before the turn of the period we have primitive primates appearing called archonta. These are more ape-like and they dwell in trees above the carnivores roaming the ground. These mammals share the land with giant dinosaurs like the Triceratops and the Tyrannosaurus rex. At this point, all the continents we have today have now separated and the once giant chain of volcanoes at the tectonic plate collision of the three continents has now been spread out as a ring of volcanoes as the gap between continuously fills with new ocean floor and this creates the ring of fire. So now we have North America, South America, Africa, and Asia. And India has now disconnected from Africa and is sliding north. Around 66 million years ago, right after Arkanta had a foothold and begins thriving, a massive extinction happens. India hits the Asian border, and as it smashes into the continent, large volcanoes form. And then around 66 million years ago, this volcanic chain erupts in a super mega flow of lava. This causes a disruption in the atmosphere, with dust clouds thickening the air, making it hard for sunlight to even reach the ground. This causes an extinction of a lot of Jurassic plants, which this extinction of plants causes a lot of the animals that rely on the plants to die off as well. The carnivores can't prey on the herbivores, so they too slowly die off. This is also compounded by a giant meteoroid hitting the Yucatan Peninsula, uplifting thousands of tons of debris into the air, adding to the unfortunate atmosphere conditions the planet already is enduring. This means that dinosaurs unfortunately came to an end at 65 million years ago, after a reign of 150 million years on Earth, and along with them were most of the dominant species on Earth at that time. And this is where I'll end this second video with the horrible dying of dinosaurs, and we will start up the new video. Thanks for watching, stay tuned.